Dr. Patricia Davidson, cardiologist, MedStar Washington Hospital Center. She's going to help us score a touchdown for our hearts. What you all know, I don't even have to ask that question anymore. I had to ask it maybe 10 years ago, but you all know that heart disease is a major killer. And so, and it's also the most preventable of all of our diseases. So that's why Dr. Hurley always focuses on heart disease, because, you know, we can't necessarily prevent HIV, we can't necessarily prevent our cancer yet, because we don't control our environment. But we can prevent our heart disease. And that's what you're here today to learn about behavior changes. The behavior changes that you should be able to go within your deepest, deepest, deepest inner soul to figure out how you can make a change in your behavior to change the disease that we have that we often prevent. And so we're going to step up our game for better health. Now the disease that you all are dying from is called atherosclerosis or hardening of the arteries and it's the primary killer of all Americans, all ethnic groups, and both genders. When you were born, your artery is supposed to look like this, nice and pink in the inside, nice and clean, and then depending upon the lifestyle your parents lead, you will, because you don't choose your lifestyle, you need to understand that this is the lifestyle your parents have chosen for you. So that when you're thinking about your children having heart disease and you're 80 and they're 60, you chose the lifestyle for them that led to their heart disease. Because at three, they did not have a credit card, they didn't shop, they didn't cook, they didn't pick their food. And so the, the plaque begins to build up depending upon the lifestyle your parents have chosen for you, and then it becomes advanced and then you start having symptoms. And that will be determined based on your lifestyle and how fast it happens. So here it is again. Now the artery wall is a factory which has all kinds of bad and good hormones in it and your job is to keep the good hormones and enzymes up and the bad ones down. So everything you do all day long will determine if the good ones go up. So if you pray, the good ones go up. If you go for a walk, the good ones go up. If you just carry up Zumba, the good ones just went up. If you are angry, the good ones go, the bad ones go up, and the good ones go down, and your artery begins to deteriorate on the inside, and it begins to contract. So every time something bad happens, your artery clamps down on itself because it's a muscle. And so, black begins to form, just like you see here, nice, it starts off with a nice fatty streak, and then a little bit more forms over time, over the decade, and then something bad happens, and the artery clamps down on itself. Those bad hormones, you're having an argument at work, your boss is driving up the, up the, up the you work for the PG public school or the DC public school, you work for the federal government or the county government, and that, which are cardiac risk factors. And then all you need is that artery just spends all day going, clamping down on itself, and then lo and behold, that plaque ruptures. And then the blood goes out into the artery wall. Now, if it totally closes off, it becomes a heart attack and a stroke. If it only partially closes off, like you see this one here, we call it an acute coronary syndrome or a TIA, a transient ischemic attack. That means that the artery did not totally close. So when somebody says you had a small heart attack or a small stroke, then what they're talking about is that you didn't have total closure of your artery wall. You only had partial closure. And total closure means that you have dead tissue. So that when you actually totally close that artery for, for hours on end, then you lose muscle in your brain and you lose muscle in your heart. And so atherosclerosis is preventable. It's not a natural process of aging. That's very critical. And it is reversible. So we are here today to talk about how to prevent it and how to accept the fact that it is not natural. Just because Dr. Hall gives you a wonderful funeral when you die from your heart attack and your stroke, which is, which is socially acceptable, and you didn't die because you were prostituted and you had HIV, you don't get a nice funeral. So that doesn't make it correct. It was a preventable disease and it was based on the lifestyle that we had chosen. And not only the lifestyle we've chosen, 
the lifestyle that the culture around us has convinced us we need yeah. to have based on the advertising industry that, is, that and all of the industries that make money off of us from making bad choices. Now you as Christians are supposed to be stronger and it is not just the illegal things that you need to be avoiding because you're not dying from the illegal things. Yes, yes. You're only talking bad about the people who died from the illegal yes, things. Yes, yes. But instead, you're dying from the legal things that you chose to pick. Yes. Because somebody convinced you that that should be part of your culture. And then by the time they finish making you think that everything is part of your culture, like Christmas and Thanksgiving are about gluttony. And how many verses are there in the Bible about gluttony, Pastor Hall? At least 50, right? Yes. And so we don't even pay attention to that. But the culture has made you think that gluttony is part of Thanksgiving um, and, and the nativity scene where there was no gluttony. There wasn't even food. So everything about everything that we do that you think is your culture and, and it becomes so socially acceptable is something that somebody else who makes money off of you has convinced you to do and that ends up harming you and clogging your arteries and making you be diabetic and making you have high blood pressure and all those things. So you need to accept the fact that somebody else has convinced you to do something that's harmful for you. And you need to stand up and say, today it is going to stop. Yes. I am now going to do the things that are put on this earth. A lot of things are put on this earth. Man has changed those things yes. and made them into profit. So we may have been put on the earth, but we changed the wheat and defined it, and now everybody's diabetic. So that so all these things are put on the earth, and we've changed the form of it. Because I know somebody will say to me, well, in Genesis it says that, 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 that whatever is in the marketplace, we can partake of, all right? But our marketplace has changed. Now, the onset is in the fetal state if your mother has high cholesterol when she's carrying you. So you cannot even be born with normal arteries if your mother has high cholesterol. Otherwise, it's going to begin in the first decade of life if you're living the usual American lifestyle. Now, erectile dysfunction, since you all hear an erectile dysfunction ad every time you watch a TV show, that's because it's so common. That is the first sign of clogged arteries because the arteries that lead down to the pelvic region are just as small as the arteries that lead to the heart. The reason you have more heart attacks and then strokes and last loss of limb is based on the size of the artery wall. The arteries that go to your heart are called coronary arteries. There's a right and a left one. They have the size of a pencil tip. You have to keep something the size of a pencil tip open for the rest of your life. Now, God, did God make a mistake? No. no. So therefore, something the size of a grapefruit has two arteries the size of a pencil tip. And you have to live the lifestyle to keep them open. The arteries that go up to your neck are the size of your little finger, and the arteries that go down to your, your toes are the size of your thumb. Therefore, it is harder to close off something the size of your thumb, which has many arteries, or a size of your, your little finger, which also has many arteries as well. But down to the pelvic region, the arteries that lead to the pelvic region are also the size of a pencil tip. So therefore, erectile dysfunction is one of the first signs that you are beginning to clog your arteries. Now, that what we need, you need to understand something, that when you get normal tests, it does not mean you have normal arteries. Now, we, decades ago, we learned about something called the vulnerable plaque. That means that is the plaque, there's only a little bit, and it's fresh, it's only been there for a couple of years. And we now know that that's the one that causes the heart attack and the stroke. Not the plaque that practically closes off the artery. If you have an artery that looks like this, big and open with a tiny bit of plaque in it, you will not have abnormal tests. If you put dye in this, it will be normal. If you do a stress test, it will be normal. Whatever you do, it's going to look normal. So that when somebody does a cardiac evaluation on you and tells you that your tests are normal, that doesn't mean your arteries are normal. And it doesn't mean that tomorrow you can't go out and have a heart attack because you started screaming at your teenage son because he took out your car and he's only 13. <laughs> so, so the issue is that this is the plaque that's going to rupture. And we found that out when we took people to the lab when they were having heart attacks. 
we would see arteries that were practically blocked and filled. And that plaque, by the way, over time becomes calcified and rock hard. That's not the plaque that's going to rupture. It's the new plaque. So we see this really ugly looking artery. And then we see the blood clot in an artery that looks like this. So we now know that this is the artery that causes that. So it's, again, about lifestyle and about getting rid of risk factors and controlling risk factors to keep plaque like this from rupturing. So a heart attack and a stroke are a bruise on the muscle wall. And a heart attack is called the MI or myocardial infarction, and it's when the artery is totally closed. That's different from congestive heart failure, which you all have been hearing about so much, because that is the number one discharge diagnosis. So that more people are in the hospital right now today with congestive heart failure than any other disease. And that is because we're able to keep you alive longer with your clogged arteries, so now you get to develop congestive heart failure. And that is the failure of the heart to beat efficiently. So with every heartbeat, your heart is doing this every second, all the blood has to go down to your toes and up to your head and recirculate around in that split second. And that's how marvelous the organ is. So every second, all the blood is, is going in and out of your total body in that second. So if a part of that muscle can't do that, then the blood stays out in your toes, it stays out in your legs, your abdomen, and your lungs, and you become congested because the heart cannot recirculate all of that. And the, and the most common cause in African Americans is uncontrolled blood pressure because the heart muscle is thick and doesn't relax properly because when you become hypertensive, you put all that pressure on the heart muscle. And, and just like the muscles you get when you, when you lift weights, the heart is lifting weights when your blood pressure is up, it becomes thick and it doesn't relax properly. The most common cause in the rest of the population is from heart attacks in which the muscle has died and there's a part of the muscle that's not functioning. Now, you see that both of these things are preventable. If you controlled your blood pressure, you wouldn't end up with heart failure from, from uncontrolled blood pressure. If you didn't have a heart attack, you wouldn't end up with just heart failure. So this is a failure of both you as the patient and of all of us as clinicians. We have not prevented your heart attack and we have not controlled your blood pressure. And that's why we now have the most common discharge diagnosis of congestive heart failure. Now, who is at risk of having clogged arteries? Anybody who eats animals every day is unlikely to have normal arteries. Anybody whose body mass index, which I think you have body mass indexes in your folder, if not, there's one on, on one of the tables here, you calculate out your body mass index, and the reason you have to have a chart is because we're the only country that uses, that does not use the metric system, so you have to convert your, your weight and your, your height into the metric system, and you come up with your body mass index. So if your body mass index is over 25, you're not going to have normal arteries. If your bad LDL cholesterol is over 100, you're not going to have normal arteries. If your systolic, the top number, blood pressure is over 120, you're not going to have normal arteries. If your fasting blood sugar is over 100, you can't have normal arteries. If you never exercise to release those good hormones called endorphins, you're not going to have normal arteries. If you smoke, nicotine is the most damaging thing we have to our artery wall because it just tears up the artery wall and a young person will end up developing plaque in their legs even. You see smokers that develop, in, that, that's one case in which you will get a lot of artery clogging in your legs if you smoke, whereas otherwise you shouldn't do that. And if you have any inflammatory process like poor oral hygiene, all you avoiding the dentist and you have plaque and you have, and you have abscesses and you just keep taking antibiotics and cleaning out your mouth, all of that is in, causes inflammatory the hormones, which are really bad, and they destroy the artery wall. If you have arthritis and chronic infections like lupus and pelvic inflammatory diseases and prostatitis, all of that puts out those bad hormones, and that allows plaque to form. So these are all of the things that, if you have any of these things, you know you don't have normal arteries. And so that when somebody says your tests are normal, you don't go out and continue the same lifestyle, you make sure that you get rid of all of these risk factors. These are called risk factors. These are the things that cause plaque. And the biggest issue is that we all have the same heart disease, but we don't all have the same mortality. Because certain people get treated, and certain people do not. And that's why Boston Scientific started the Close the Gap program. Because we have whole segments of our population, women in particular, and African Americans, and Latino Americans, and Native, American, uh, Native Americans, who are not being treated or prevented. So we see differences in our mortality rate. 
And so in women, though, we see that African-American women have the highest disparity of anybody. And that's because as a woman, you get you have two problems. There's people, doctors didn't think women had heart disease for decades, and then they didn't think black women had heart disease, and then you didn't matter anyways. So that you were the least likely, even in studies that are being done, in which they look, they take actors and actresses and they put them all in the same hospital gown, and they all have the same history of chest pain and a positive stress test, and who should go on to find out if they have heart disease, then the majority of doctors didn't even pick the black woman. So that even though everything is the same, you are least likely to be referred for appropriate studies and prevention. So that's why your mortality rate is so much higher. Asian women have the lowest mortality rate for everything in this country because they do. There's only three things you have to do to prevent 80% of the diseases in this country. And that's stay thin, not smoke, and walk. That's all you have to do. And 80%, and then you just have to wait for HIV and cancer to take you out in a Big Mac truck. Because everything else is controlled by that. Stay thin, not smoke, and walk. Now, I don't know if Asian women are walking, but they stay thin and they don't smoke. And they then have the lowest mortality rate from everything in this country. These numbers are not accurate because Latino women are not counted and Native American women are not counted unless there's something about them that makes you think that they are that. So they, and when Mexican American women have worse risk factors than African American women, so we know this is not true. And the Latino community is not homogeneous. So they are undercounted. And then white women are next. But when you look at the men, who got most of the prevention? Who got all of the education? Who got all the research? White men, so they have the lowest. Whereas black men have the highest, Latino men and Native American men all up there together, and Asian men smoke, so they lost their benefit. Simple as that, all they have to do is smoke, and then they no longer have the lowest mortality rate. Now let's talk in detail about the things that this is where you play a role, and how do you get rid of your risk factors? The things that cause athletes Stress in the heart. We all know that we are the most stressed, and African American women, it's already been documented, are the most stressed of anybody in this country. And so when you stay under stress, the bad hormones go up, and you end up clamping down on that artery all day long, and your blood pressure stays up, your heart rate stays up, your insulin resistance goes up so that you can't metabolize your sugar well, your platelet activity, those are the cells, the nasty cells that cause the, the blood to count, uh, that come together, and that's why when we take aspirin, we decrease the platelet cells and the blood runs a little bit smoother, and so that becomes abnormal. Uh, the, the plaque that you have in your artery wall becomes unstable and can rupture easier, and you have a whole disruption of the coronary flow through the arteries. And then you have arrhythmias of abnormal heartbeats, and you have more abnormal heartbeats. All of that happens when you work for, for, for the, the public school and the federal government and the local government. All day long, you stay in this terrible state. So then that means that you have to learn to deal with your stress because you know you want your retirement that you deserve, right? Mm -hmm. So we're talking 20 and 30 years here. So that means that you have to learn to deal with your stress so that you don't have this going on every eight hours of the day when you go to work. There are hereditary causes. Now how do you know if you have a hereditary predisposition to heart disease? If young people in your family have heart disease, if your grandma had a heart attack at 80 and your father had a heart attack at 75, that doesn't count. That was acquired by lifestyle. But if you have members in your family in their 40s and early 50s that have heart attacks, then there is probably a genetic predisposition. But what do you say? You say, okay, well, they had heart attacks, I'm going to have one too. No. You make sure that you get rid of your risk factors so that you can overcome bad genes. You can always overcome bad genes with lifestyle changes. So if everybody in your family has high blood pressure and everybody in your family had a heart attack, then you get rid of your risk factors. Now, if a lot of people have heart attacks, everybody, including the children in the family, need to have their cholesterol checked because there could be a hereditary abnormality in the way they handle cholesterol, and that should be treated aggressively. And you know that if your bad cholesterol is over 150, it is more likely due to bad genes and that you don't have enough enzymes in your liver to metabolize your cholesterol, and that means you should be on treatment. And all the pediatricians need to know that. We don't treat the children early, but we at least follow them very closely. Poor behavior. The advertising industry tries to addict you to food that is harmful. Smoking is promoted by the advertising industry. 
but we ended up tricking them, right? Because we took the suit out, and they had to admit that they were actually doing that. So, so we know that. And gluttony is encouraged at all cultural events, with Thanksgiving, all you can eat restaurants, and Christmas. And so, what what do Christians do here? You're most likely smoking. But the gluttony, that's there, is it not? So, so this is leading to diseases and the food that you pick. So when you pick food that you know causes a disease, why are you still doing it? Your body is a temple. You are disrespecting your temple when you know something is harmful and you keep doing it just because it's socially acceptable and just because it's legal. That doesn't mean it's right in the eyes of God because Christians have heart attacks and strokes, do they not? Now, if none of y'all got heart attacks and strokes when you went to church, then you'd say, that's fine, praying was enough. But praying is not enough because Christians, in fact, most of the pastors in the district all have, have um, you know, scars down the middle of their chest because they had bypass surgery. So clearly, the amount of prayer does not stop the arteries from clogging. It is the behavior that you get from the prayer that you do. And you need to start thinking about the kind of prayer that you do. What are you praying for? World peace is good. Not going to happen, but world peace is good. Keep praying for it. You pray to have somebody help you change your behavior. And that's what your prayer partner should be. And I always say that when you're about to turn into Popeyes, that's when you call your prayer partner. Yeah. <laughs> and I pray to you down Central Avenue. Just keep praying all the way down Central Avenue until you get to a residential neighborhood. And that's where your prayer partner comes in. So when you get together to pray, you should be praying for changing of behavior to respect your temple, to stop doing things that are legal and socially acceptable, but clearly cause disease. And we know it causes disease, because we talk about it all the time. But you keep doing it, and you keep doing it, because you are addicted. And the food industry knows what addicts you. They know that caffeine is addicting. They know that there's, why, there's caffeine in chocolate, that's why it's addicting. There's caffeine in soda and, and, and coffee, that's why it's addicting. They know that sugar's addicting. They know that salt's addicting. There is sugar and salt in everything you eat. The Lord put it there naturally. Sodium chloride is in everything that you put in your mouth. And that's what salt is. You have enough. The Lord said this is the amount of sodium chloride you should have in your food. And you made the decision to add a whole lot more. The amount of sugar. Sugar is in everything you eat. Sweet potatoes. Sweet corn. Sweet carrots. It's in everything that you eat. So it's when you decide to candy it and add more sugar that you end up with the diabetes. So everything, everything is in the food that you eat. The problem is that you made a decision to change it. Now, blood pressure should be under, I'm, I'm making it very simple because they have all these fancy charts about stage one, stage two, forget all that. Under 120 and 80. If it's over that, you're forming plaque. We may not be treating you until you get over 140, but that does not mean you don't have hypertension, and it doesn't mean you're not forming plaque during that time. So that when somebody says that you're borderline, or that you're borderline diabetic, you're borderline hypertensive, you are still forming plaque. It's just that we know that at a certain level of sugar and blood pressure, you can reverse it by exercising, losing a few pounds and changing what you eat. So we don't give you a pill the first time you walk into the office with a sugar of 102 and a blood pressure of 135 because we know you can treat that. So I always like to think of pre-diabetes and pre-hypertension as the first trimester of pregnancy, and you all know how that turns out. <laughs> so, the SPRINT study. You know that about a year and a half ago, there was a task force that said, it's okay to be 150, and we don't really have strong enough data to make our blood pressures lower. And then within months of that, fortunately, um, a very important study came out, funded by the NIH, and they found, they looked at people who had 120 and 140, and lo and behold, if you were 120 or less, you had one-third reduction in heart attack, stroke, and heart failure, and a death rate reduced by 25%. So we no longer have to argue that. Be very careful about task force. A task force are a group of epidemiologists who are some very anal people 
who have to have a p-value of something in order to say it should be a suggestion for the population. You are not p-values. You are people, and we know that when you go above 120, you're going to form black. We know when the sugar goes over 100, you can form black. So, you know, so, so make sure that you understand the difference between the arguments that we do within the medical community. Let us argue about it, because when we finally come up with these decisions, you don't hear about that. The press tells you what the task force says because it's sensational, and they don't bother to tell you about this really complicated study that comes out in uh, the journal of American Medical Society, the New England Medical Journal. They may have a little blurb somewhere on page 30, but you don't hear about this. You don't hear about the arguments. You don't hear about the, the horrible, nasty letters that we write to those people when they do that. And so we argue about that. Let us argue those points. You just need to know that the lower your numbers, the less likely the plaque. And you let the epidemiologist argue with the clinicians over what that number should be. I gave you the numbers that we suggest you should be if you really want to prevent disease. And you can tell the epidemiologist to go somewhere. <laughs> Wait, for every pound you lose, you get a two millimeter drop in blood pressure. So this is why if you're 140 and you come to the office, we don't have to give you a pill the first day because all you had to do was lose five pounds and you'd be 130. All you had to do was lose two pounds and you would go down to 136. So this is why we don't have to rush you on a pill. So weight is directly related to your blood pressure. And salt is for snow and sore throat. It has no business on your table because sodium chloride is in everything you eat. The food industry wants you to add more because when you add more, it becomes addicting. Like, what are those potato chips, Pringles? You can't have just one. And you really can't have just one because the salt and the fat in that potato chip makes it addicting. And so you cannot have just one. And so have you ever had a potato chip that's baked without salt? You can have one. So <laughs> they gave you, they, put, they know exactly what it takes. And they even have people who stand around, they hire people and have something called the bliss point. So everybody tastes the, the, whatever they have produced. And when the group of people say, this is the one that's the, that, that I can't have just one, that's the one they put on the market. So they are addicting. They are deliberately addicting it. You who are Christians, you can avoid addictions. You can, you can, your mind can stand up and say, I don't have to have somebody who went to Harvard and got an MBA and an advertising degree tell me what to do with my body. You can stand up against that. Yeah. And so you need to say that I know this isn't right. So that everything they put in a package was meant to make somebody rich and kill you. So if you cannot understand the, the ten syllable words on the side of the package, it's not meant for human consumption. It's meant to make somebody rich. Oh, and by the way, somebody's going to ask me the question, what about Himalayan salt and what about kosher salt? Okay. Food industry game. They think if they tell you they climb the Himalayan mountain, <laughs> that makes the sodium chloride less dangerous than the sodium chloride that was mined from Iowa or the sodium chloride that came out of the sea. And they think if they prey on it, because there is Christian salt too, and the kosher salt, I don't know what, what you do with kosher salt because I thought kosher was about how you killed animals. So they just went and labeled it kosher so that you would think it's better. I mean, and so these are all the tricks of the industry that they end up doing. Um, and so that you end up, everybody comes in and says, what's wrong with Himalayan salt? It's just bigger, and they make it look bigger, and they may put a little bit of coloring into it, and all that type of thing. But it's all sodium chloride. And that's because you need the thing that it is something better than the regular table salt from Morgan's. Now, powdery white substances. You know what you all do to those people who take those illegal powdery white substances? You know how you preach on that, right? So salt and sugar produce, promote hypertension and diabetes. Slaves, the purpose of slaves, the major industry, was the sugar industry. It was our ancestors that had to produce the salt and the sugar for the Europeans. And now, we are the ones that are slaves to sugar and salt. So the next time you think you should have sugar and salt, you remember, and this is a perfect weekend to remember it, you remember what your ancestors had to do. They had to die to produce that for somebody else. So you do not need to die by eating that, now that you're able to have access to it. And 
legal powdery substances don't kill anywhere near as many people as the legal ones. And the role of obesity, you gain your weight around your stomach as you age and your metabolism slows, and lo and behold, it, re it causes insulin resistance, which means the cells in your pancreas cannot handle sugar. And so everything gets here when you're older. And so you have to start measuring your waist size. And, and so for African American men and women, or anybody of color, you have to have a waist size that is thinner than European men and women. So the myth that you should be heavier because you think your bone size is bigger, you know your bone size based on your wrist. And you, you look at your wrist, there's nothing fat about your wrist, okay? And so therefore, all that extra weight that you're carrying is fat, and, you, and this concept that you think that you're historically supposed to have more, it's the other way around. You develop disease at lower body weights and at lower waist sizes than the European people. And they've done that research around the world, and all women of color, when they, like, like women of India, they are especially prone to diabetes once their waist size gets above 31.5. So you get your disease at an earlier rate. And if, you're, if your sugar is high or your blood pressure, your cholesterol, you have metabolic syndrome or that pre-diabetic state that we don't have to give you a pill yet, but you can reverse. Diabetics cannot have normal arteries. So by the time you are diagnosed, you have abnormal arteries because you spent 10 years prior to that forming plaque. Remember, the sugar above 100 forms plaque. We don't treat it yet, and you spend 10 years in that state. By the time we actually diagnose you, you cannot have normal arteries. And so we call that a coronary artery disease equivalent. And for diabetics, you all need to know that you should all be on something called a statin. That is a, blood, that, that is a medicine that protects the artery wall, whether your cholesterol is elevated or not, because we know your arteries cannot be normal. And weight, if your body mass index is over 25, you are most likely going to die from your weight because it leads to all of the other risk factors that you have. And this is what happens when you're overweight. You end up having more stroke, coronary heart disease, diabetes, hypertension, gallbladder disease, arthritis, gout, deep vein thrombosis, venous stasis, cancer of the breast, colon, uterus, pancreas, kidney, prostate, sleep apnea, fatty liver, and reproductive abnormalities like polycystic ovarian disease. And I had to have another slide. Um, when you talk about the heart, structural changes take place in the heart. Just the same as they do with hypertension, the upper chamber, the atrium stretches, you have a greater chance of having atrial fibrillation that you hear about in all those commercials with the blood thinners, and the, and the uh, left ventricle gets thick, just like the hypertension. So even though you may have a normal blood pressure, your heart will still look like you have hypertension. And fat is a metabolically active tissue that attacks every organ in your body. And who is overweight in this country? Mexican-American women and African-American women. So you see that Mexican-American women cannot, if you end up dividing up the, the, the Latino population, they can't have low um, death rates from heart disease. Asian women, the thinnest in the country, lowest from everything. And this is what you have to fight. We have, this is what we have to fight. Our magazine's telling us that the full figure revolution, if you've got it, flaunt it. And so African American women can flaunt the highest death rate from heart disease. Prevention. If you walk 30 minutes a day, you have a 50% reduction in heart attack, stroke, and cancer. So whatever you do to prevent heart disease and stroke, you also prevent cancer. So this is what the data shows. The more you do the exercise, the greater your chances are of change. And that's because you release endorphins. And nutrition, you are what you eat. We have um, um, more detailed examples of what you should be eating. But basically, you need to know that your bad cholesterol should ideally be under 100. Now, if you go to Quest Lab, your lab is going to say under 130. The average heart attack and stroke is 130. Lab course says under 100. Um, I have a patient who went up to Hopkins, and her lab done at the hospital said under 130, and she had heart disease, and she was supposed to be under 70. 
If you've already been diagnosed with diabetes or heart disease or stroke or any plaque anywhere that has been seen on any scans that you've had, you should be under 70 because the studies that were done show the trend towards reversal when you get to be under 70. And this is where the epidemiologists are right. We do not have an actual number in a study that says this is the number that prevents plaque from forming. We don't have that data. But we see a trend towards reversing the plaque when you get to be under 70. So then you need to decide, do you want to be where there's a trend towards reversing plaque, or do you want to be where the heart attack and stroke rate is? So nobody should be over 100, and your goal should be to be as low as possible under 70. And cholesterol only comes from animals. You're an animal, you're made up of cholesterol, and your liver is made for your cholesterol. If you have a cholesterol that is above your LDL, forget the total, if your LDL is over 100, it means your liver is on strike and says, I have already metabolized what I'm supposed to do for today, and I'm not doing the pig and the cow and the fish and the chicken today, all right? And it just floats through your artery wall. So that's how you know if you have a liver that's on strike. So an LDL of over 100, your liver is saying, I've had enough. And you all have, you're all going to ask me about statins because of the whole anti-statin campaign. The reason statins are safe, not safe, I'm saying the reason statins are, are so potent is because they get rid of all those ten-syllable words and they increase the ten-syllable good ones. And I'm going to ask you questions about that. Protein comes from beans, it comes from animals, and you need to pick the lowest cholesterol animal if you're going to eat an animal. So that is the simplest animals because they have the least amount of plaque, least amount of cells. So the animals that swim and the animals that fly are the simplest animals. The animals that walk on the bottom of the ocean and walk on the land are more complicated, therefore they have more cells and more cholesterol. If you take the skin off, which is where all the cells are, you have all these little holes in your in the skin of the animal, and that's where all the cells are. So if you take the skin off, the meat underneath is low, is the lowest in cholesterol. So pick the lowest cholesterol animals that you can find and then check your cholesterol level. You cannot eat an animal every time you eat and have an artery free of cholesterol. And color code your food, and that's what you see on your table. That green food is lowest in sugar, highest in nutrients, red, yellow, and orange food is high in sugar, but also high in nutrients, and white food is refined. That means the food industry is tricking you again, high in sugar and low in nutrients. But you think it's better because it's white. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. Symptoms. Real quickly, symptoms differ, as was mentioned earlier. Doesn't mean that most people will have chest pain, but you may also have back pain, dyspnea, shortness of breath, and nausea and fatigue. So if you are not a person who is very athletic, and that's my theory in terms of why women don't get a whole lot of chest pain, because we stop exercising in the ninth grade because of our hair. That's, that's when we start taking our daughters to the hairdresser, and so therefore we send them to, to school with excuses for swimming classes and all that kind of thing. But you learn from the Olympics, we can swim, okay? So get a hairdo that will allow you to swim, all right? And give that hairdo to your child so she can swim. And so she can do all of those things. And so the issue here is that you stop exercising in the ninth grade, and then you end up not being able to have chest pain, so instead you get very fatigued and short of breath. So if you can't do your shopping, and you can't do your, you know, you, you can't get to Lord and Taylor and enjoy a whole day, it's because your arteries are clogged, and you need to be studied for heart disease. And so there is a bias in terms of who gets what. This is what the angioplasty is. You go down into the artery, and you smash open the plaque. I said smash over the plaque. Now you know when you smash something, scar tissue forms. So don't think that, oh, I had an angioplasty in a stent. I'm free of disease. No, you now have a new disease of somebody smashing up inside of your artery wall, and you have to keep that artery open because it's been smashed at. And so scar tissue is forming. You have to be on lots of medicine in order to keep that from happening. And so who should get an angioplasty? This is very important. You have to have symptoms. Angioplasties do not stop heart attacks or death. Why? Because the artery that they're opening up is the artery that's nearly closed and calcified. That's not the artery going to cause the heart attack, right? It's the vulnerable plaque. So you then have to work on reversing all the other plaques. And so you have to have symptoms and you have to have several tests that prove that the artery they're about to angioplasty 
is the one that's causing your symptoms. Otherwise, you should be treated medically and you should be on the medicine that helps reverse the disease. That's a very important point. And if your doctor's not doing those tests, in fact, they usually have to because they lose the privilege of the health. And then if, you, if, if angioplasty is not appropriate for you because you have too much disease, then you end up doing bypasses, either from an artery in your chest wall or a vein from your leg. And, and this is, um, this is one, one um, ad that I always put up. The doctor really doesn't want me to end with that because I have to end on a positive note. Um, you were looking at a lethal weapon, and the fact is that the fork kills more people because we fill it up with high fat, high cholesterol foods causing heart attacks and strokes. But we're going to end with Proverbs 27 verse That a prudent person foresees the danger ahead and takes precautions. But the simpleton goes blindly on and suffers the consequences. So hopefully nobody here wants to be a simpleton and that you will begin to respect your temple and use your prayer partner and your prayer circle to then pray for peace, yes. Um, still not going to happen, but still pray for change in lifestyle so that you will stop allowing the advertising industry to influence you more than your good common sense. Does anyone have any questions for Dr. Patricia Davidson? You want to come to the middle meeting halfway? Oh, okay. Thank you so much for such an informative uh, presentation. I'm Dave Samuel Brooke again, so that I can really understand it. I've heard all these things before, but I'm the one that's going to ask about that. All I've heard is the negative uh, comments, and I was just wondering. Uh, if you could give us a little bit more information. Okay, the word stat is because the generic name of all of the cholesterol drugs ends in stat. Superstat, metastat, pravastat, etc. Alright? That's your Crestor, Lipitor, Metacor, Pravacol, Lescol, Zocor, and, and Lizal. Uh, and so the statin has been shown to be life saving. Now there's a lot of anti statin rhetoric out there. Statins may cause muscle aches. If you get muscle aches, you have to stop the drug. It doesn't mean that you'll have muscle aches from all the statins. So I just named eight statins, then I'm not. So you move on to each one of them until you find one if you absolutely need to have one. And who absolutely needs to have one? A person who's had a stroke or a TIA, a person who's had a heart attack, a person who, who has an hereditary abnormality, um, and a person who's diabetic have to be on statins if you want to reverse plaque. Now, plaque has been shown to be reversed by somebody by the name of Dean Ornish, where he put people on, on a vegan diet, a very regimented vegan diet. Now, the question is, how many people here can stay on a vegan diet for the rest of their life? One, you know, he's pushing her hand up. Two, three, one half a hand and, and three hands, all right? So therefore, that's not practical for you all, is it? No. So if you cannot do it, then you can't spend the next part of your life hoping that you can do it, praying that you can do it, when you can't do it. So you go on the statin because you have to immediately start reversing and holding down the process. So that's what this is about. You need to know that, that, that I went to a conference and a person who uh, wrote the textbook of medicine, Eugene Bromwell, and was the principal investigator on all the statin trials that we've ever done. And he asked the audience of about 900 physicians, he said, how many of you all are on statin? And I'd say that 885 of them raised their hand, okay? So all your doctors were on statin because they like to eat filling me on and they like to go to the Capitol Grill and all those places, okay? So that, so that the data shows that, that it, it reverses plaque and it stabilizes plaque and, and it also prevents a second heart attack and a second stroke and it also prevents diabetics who mostly die from heart attacks and strokes from having a heart attack and a stroke. So these are very important medicines. Now if you can do it without a statin, then fine. So that, now we're talking primary prevention where you haven't had any disease. I mean, that's very different from secondary prevention. 
if you've already been diagnosed with the disease or had an event, you need to be on a stack because it's just too dangerous for you to be playing around. You could also try being a vegan, and if you succeeded, and if your numbers go down so low, like down to 30, if your LDL goes to 30, you don't need a stack. But when you stop the statin, they go right back up, so you can't get to 99 and say, oh, I'm pure, let me stop my statin, because it'll be right back up to 150. And if you have a hereditary defect, the way I tell my patients who use me is a lot of young people and they get all upset, I don't want to take medicine for the rest of my life. I said, well, you could have had cystic fibrosis, you could have sickle cell anemia. There's a whole lot of horrible congenital diseases out there you could have had. So if you have a hereditary defect in your liver, you've got any drugs that will treat that. Um, so then don't get so bummed out about having, having that particular hereditary abnormality. So, so statins have some very good data. Um, yes, there have been a couple of cases of acute mental confusion, and again, you stop the drugs, and you're one of the unfortunate people who can't use it. All the side effects of statins are reversible. Heart attacks and strokes are not. So that if you have a side effect, and you're supposed to be following your liver to make sure your liver tolerates, and any drug that goes through the liver or the kidneys, you follow blood work to make sure those numbers stay normal. So that's, that's the routine for all medicine. Um, and so if your liver stays normal and you're not having side effects, then you are one of the lucky ones. And if you have a side effect and you can't tolerate any of the eight drugs, then that's unfortunate for you because you will now have progression of your, of your clogged artery and the consequences that come with that. And you're just going to have to try to do it with diet. So, so that's how, and then, and then when you try to do it with diet, you, you can't be in, in the, the non of three people. If you, you have to do it with diet and you can't tolerate it, that, your life depends upon it. Oh, he asked a question about CoQ10. Um, CoQ10 does go down with, with statins, and that's one of the things you're going to see in all that late literature that comes in your, in your mail every day. Okay. We have not proven that raising CoQ10 with that very expensive vitamin um, makes a difference, and it does not stop the side effects, but if you can afford CoQ10, and they say cost is as the cheapest, um, if you can afford CoQ10 when you're on a statin, then I would say definitely you should be able to do that. It's just that we don't have data that have proven that taking it has, has made a difference in what it is. But I, I would want, if I had to take a statin for the rest of my life, I would want to be on CoQ10 because we still do not know what the effects of lowering that with the statin are. So I, I, if a person can afford it, and I tell them that supposedly it costs them to get a massive amount for a reasonable price. Well, that's what you should be doing anyway. I mean, I mean, it's, I mean that's, you wanted to know if you alternate vegetables and meat. I mean, that's, vegetables should be every day. And if you want to skip, you, and you should have some meatless days. The only way you're going to get, unless you have a really super duper liver, the only way you're going to keep your LDL down is by having, you know, they talk about meatless Mondays and things like that, is by having several meatless days. So when you get your LDL and say it's 110 and you're eating meat seven days a week, well, you probably go down to four or five and you go down under, under 100. So you have to see how super duper your liver is because if you have enough enzymes metabolizing your cholesterol, it'll show up in your numbers. And so you have to figure out how much animal products you can eat for your liver, because everybody's liver is different, and everybody has a different set of, of enzymes in their liver metabolizing their, their cholesterol. So basically, a high cholesterol means that your liver is on strike. So you have to figure out how to get around that, um, and how to, you know, what what the amount of meat you can take in, and which meats, and try to make it the lowest cholesterol meats, and see what you can do, and still enjoy what you're eating. But you have to enjoy what you're eating, and you're not going to eat it. Thank you, Dr. Davidson. Tremendous presentation as usual. I'm from a universe that you did not name the name those risk factors of people who work with the district government, the federal government, and school teachers. You forgot those of us who are pastors <laughs> who have to respond to crises. I have a friend who had a massive stroke. He's a vegan. He does 50% raw, 50% cooked. Um, He's a vegan. I see it all at vegan restaurants. Dear friend of mine, he had a massive stroke. He has, uh, I wouldn't name his doctor, uh, she's well known. He walks every day, he's thin. But because he's a pastor who has to respond like me, I better have been here to do us, I would be in trouble with my sister. 
Dr. Herman. So then uh, we, I have to be here. The stress. Y'all hear that? This is supposed to be stress. <laughs> I mean, we can respond to stress. And we're having strokes and heart attacks. So I'm a pastor. Okay, but most pastors don't have healthy lifespans, okay? So that, that's the need to one. Most do not. Now, for the gentleman who had the stroke, who was the leader, um, the, a very common cause of stroke is atrial fibrillation. So now that we know this, and now that we have um, patches that we can put on, and three and four week um, um, event monitors, and they come in the form of a patch now, um, so it's not that big, bulky uh, transistor radio that you had to carry on before. So, so what we do, anytime anybody has a TIA or stroke, we make them put a, you should have somebody put a 30 day or three, three week or four week um, monitor on you to see if you can pick up an abnormal heart rate. That is a very common cause of stroke now. I mean, it always was, we were just missing it and we really didn't have the technology to, uh, to pick it up. So he should be, he should get an event monitor to make sure that's not the cause. But yes, stress could have been it. And then the other thing is, to say he was a vegan. Now, we, we, when we talk about other people, we don't know what his cholesterol is. He may have had a hereditary abnormality, and one thing vegans do not do is they will not take a statin. They don't care what their cholesterol is. And so if they have a hereditary abnormality, even being a vegan, their cholesterol is going to be elevated. And so it is very hard to convince somebody who is a vegan with an LDL of 160 that they need to be on a statin. That is really difficult for them to do. So, um, so, he, so you don't know his data. Um, so he could have had, he has may have an hereditary animality, but atrial fibrillation should be looked for. But stress is playing a role. Okay, we have one more question. We have to take a break shortly. So we're gonna take one more question, okay? I just wanted to find out what happens during weight loss surgery. People that were diabetic and high blood pressure, and then their body, they don't need, they're all, you know, they're not diabetic anymore. Because diabetes is directly related to your weight. So whether you lost it, no matter how you lose your weight, your sugar is going to come down, your blood pressure is going to come down, everything's going to change. Your good cholesterol is going to go up. Because good cholesterol is not associated with food, it's only associated with smoking, exercise, and weight. Um, and then your triglycerides, um, which is associated with your sugars and carbohydrates, um, will come down. And, um, and so all of that happens is just purely the, the, the change in the weight. Thank you, Dr. Davidson. That was some